Hello, Silas here. This is Dishing on Dish. This is a series that my friend and I do where we talk about food, specifically food. It's a sub-series of the You Are What You Consume series. So say hello to everyone. <laughs> we can get into this. Good afternoon, everybody. I hope you're well. Hopefully the weather's better where you are than it is here. It's pretty muggy in the city here, 60 degrees and kind of bleak. <laughs> And Stephen is in the city. <laughs> you say your name. It's my friend Stephen. He's in the city. That's why this is the city because it's the city, the city, the Big Apple, New York City. He's in that place. And with this series, specifically with the Dish on Dish series, we've had one other person come on for part of the house. No, that's not even up yet, so she didn't really talk about that. We don't talk about that, Stephen and I, because we're, we're a bit ornery about that. But we had a guest come on to talk about uh, one of those one of the restaurants that we've been to. But Stephen is a bit of a gourmand. He's also human foie gras. He's hunting around New York City and going to eventually spread out to the rest of the world and hunt down all the foie gras dishes that are possibly there to be had. But he goes to different restaurants and then he comes back and he tells us about the food. He sends me a document. I sometimes read the document ahead of time. This time I haven't read the document ahead of time, but just go in. I read certain dishes. Then he tells me what the actual food is about and things like that. He has a history in the food service industry, so he's very well versed in these things. We both enjoy cooking and food and things like that. And that's just what this general series is about. We've done about how many restaurants now, Stephen? Like eight, eight, nine? Somewhere around there, yeah. I'd have to go back and count. Yeah. Yep. Maybe more, but this is good, probably going to be part 19, but it's part 19. We say that. No, it can't be 19. Can't be 19. Dish and dish. Could it be 19? No, it's not 19. I think it's like 17 was the food. We Actually, we might have done, I don't know, we've done a lot, but yeah. many of those have different parts. This one's going to be much shorter because he just recently went out to a restaurant and he posted some really amazing pictures. And it's like, okay, really, most of the pictures he posts are amazing. He goes to really good restaurants. <laughs> just admit that. But the series is relatively long. We've had those and we plan on continuing to do these. Um, today, we're going to be talking about the restaurant Intersect by Lexus and uh the way we do this is I ask, we have an intro when we're starting in a new restaurant like we are today, where I ask him about the place and the content and then uh, some different things about it. So we'll start off right now. Stephen, could you tell us a bit about the place and maybe you can throw in things about the location as well, where it actually is located in New York? So this is kind of an interesting, it's, um, it's, it's a higher end restaurant. It's actually owned by Lexus, the car company. If you go there, you'll actually... <laughs> Yeah, you'll actually see Le Lexus uh, icons and there's some decor and everything that's Lexus themed. There's two parts to this restaurant. It's located uh, 14th Street. It's kind of near um, kind of near Chelsea Market, like in that sort of area. I'm trying to think of the streets like Gansevoort, that kind of area. Um, there's two there's two parts of the restaurant. There's a lounge where it's it's a bar and there's small plates and there's the fine dining, the dining room. I took Andrea, aka Libertarian Wife, out for an early birthday dinner. Originally, uh, her birthday is actually Christmas Eve, but, you know, that's going to be tough because, you know, yeah. I'm going to see – yeah, I'm going to see my parents. She's going to Florida. So I figured, okay, since we usually get dinner once a week, I figured just, you know, take her out one of these preceding days. I wanted to go so to the – Christmas. <laughs> was, yeah, the, yeah. If you're a lot of restaurants, you got to book ahead of time for some of these if you're in somewhere like the United States of America, right? Yeah. I mean, in New and York City, I mean. And, and the thing is, the thing is too. I wanted to take her to the fine dining, but the the issue is that this time of year it's so busy because restaurants are pretty much booked solid up until January or so. So it's one of those things. Like if I went by myself at like five o'clock on a Monday or something, I could probably get in. But she's usually only free like eight or nine o'clock at night, and especially like middle later of the week, it's like it's not going to happen unless someone happens to cancel and you happen to get in in time or something. But um, the lounge is open, and I, I saw they had some really cool-looking small plates. I figured, okay, we'll go there, and then next month, month when things uh, die down a little bit, we can go to the fine dining. Yep. And the way I found out about this place, it's kind of interesting. It was actually uh, via Instagram, um, you know, because I follow a lot of restaurant pages. I guess their, their page starts showing up as recommended, and then I, I, I followed the page, and I thought it was some really cool stuff. And then, um, you know, I really liked what they had to do. I really liked what they were posting. I wanted to go there. And then I also spoke to our friend Rose, and Rose spoke very highly of it. And Rose has very, some would say picky, some would say discerning tastes. So I thought, <laughs> well, if she if if she spoke very highly of it, I mean, let's give it a shot. And I thought, you know, I thought, okay, let's why don't I take her here for her, you know, her birthday? Yeah. Wow, that's a great looking building. It just yeah. uh, it's really yeah. appealing. I mean, you, what time did you go? I'm seeing here the cover on the website. It's it's at night, it's very lit up in a really interesting, yeah. alluring kind of way. Yeah. We went yeah. we went at about we went at about nine o'clock. Yeah. 
Okay, so I'm, I'm trying to see here. That's a cool thing. I guess I was wondering, like, by Lexus, I probably is a Lexus. When you just throw that name Lexus out there, I'm amazing. It actually would be the Lexus thing. And here I'm just checking on the Wikipedia. It says Lexus is a luxury vehicle division of the Japanese automaker Toyota. And the Lexus brand is marketed uh, in more than 70 countries and territories worldwide. And it's Japan's largest selling make of premium cars. It is ranked among the 10 largest Japanese uh, global brands and markets. So I'm trying to see, uh, let's see if they're here in a uh, restaurant. Um, no, rest, uh, okay, it's not here. The restaurant doesn't come up in the Wikipedia page, but it, is it, could, is it, could it, are you sure it's all run, ran by them? Was it kind of like a thing, maybe it's a kind of sponsorship type of thing, or you kind of just put your name out there? But these kind of companies, like Toyota, with a company that big, many of these companies no longer really just focus on one thing. They'll have some connection to some other field and something like that. There's, the amount of money that's coming through some of these massive companies, they normally diversify their portfolio in some, some kinds of ways in their interests. So uh, yeah, do you, do you know if, if it's actually in there? I, I don't know the details. My sense is it's probably what you're getting at of like, okay, we want to open a restaurant, so we'll, we'll sponsor some chef, we'll give them all this money, a place and everything, but then in return, our name has to be mentioned and they have to advertise the brand. That's probably what it is. That'd be my guess. Um, I... I I, w I learned maybe a year or so ago that Armani also actually has a restaurant, which is interesting. Okay. It's near it's near it's near uh, Trump Tower. Rose spoke highly of that place too. I thought about going. The thing is though, I held back at the time for two reasons. One, it's a little pricey, and two, the menu is very similar to Felidia. And it's like I mm -hmm. see this stuff. I see this stuff all. I was seeing this stuff like all day, every day. So I'm like, I'm not really interested in eating it out on my days off. Um, but she spoke very highly of it. She said the service there is great too. So maybe sometime in the future, I'll head over there too. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, was I at the wrong? I think this was a problem. I think I was. I, was, I might have been at the wrong website. It might have been at the at the car website. I was at Discover Lexus, and the cover of Discover Lexus it has an Intersect restaurant. So that just shows that I think is it going on? I think it had the Intersect restaurant at the cover. But let's actually go to the Intersect NYC restaurant. Yeah, Intersect by Lexus. Now here we're at the restaurant. So now can you tell us a bit about the interior, the tables, and the ambiance that was in there? Yeah, it has, you can, if you see the picture, I think you probably see the picture as well. It's a very mm -hmm. modern decor, no white tablecloths. The lounge where we sat, it's like these, um, these black tables. I don't know what that is, if that's marble or what the material is, but you know, you sit on couches, there's candles. Um, the bathroom was very interesting. I thought how there were, um, there was this big like communal kind of sink, but then there were these automated, um, soap dispensers, but they were actually, they looked like bottles, but the bottles themselves were automated. I thought that was very interesting. And then there's a staircase leading up to the main dining room. Of course, that's similar to the downstairs, but of course, no couches. It's more tables and everything. Um, again, very modern, like marble countertops, these nice pillars, all this. Uh, it's, it's definitely going for a more modern look. Like it's not it's not like per se or somewhere where it's the white tablecloths and very, you know, um, I'm not going to say I'm not I don't know if I'd say passe because some places still do that and make it work. But like I think for the type <laughs> of, but like but I think for the type of place that this is like it would be kind of weird. Yeah. <laughs> OK. And um, now can you tell us a bit about the menu in the actual restaurant as I try to get to it and see what they have to say here? Sure. So for the lounge, it's it's a. Um, it's like an izakaya menu. So it's um, it's small, it's small plates. It's basically it's basically um, you can do tamaki. There's a few tamaki rolls, which we order. Tamaki is a hand roll. Basically, it's a piece of nori that's sort of open. There's rice and there's a thing on top of it. And you just grab it, roll it up and eat it. Uh, there's yakitori. That's the skewers. There's a few other little small plates like there's like these higher end sliders. And then there's two desserts. The fine dining, of course, is more intricate. Like you have more composed plates. There's a um, there's a tasting menu. I think it's like 225, 225 a person or something. Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah, it's so there's that and then you can but then there's also small plates, um, you know, there's small plates and there's like entrees. So like larger and then like they have things like, you know, it, it's interesting. There's actually some Cajun themes here. There's uh, sorry, some Creole themes. Yeah, I can't mix those up. So there's like higher end, <laughs> bis higher end biscuits. There's fried pickles, deviled eggs, um, a barbecue shrimp. Uh, let's see here, West African peanut soup. But it's like it's like a, it's like a refined versions of this. because I guess the chef is from uh, New Orleans. So pretty cool. Yeah. Yeah, uh, it, it looks pretty nice, and um, seeing it's it's on the Michelin list here. Yeah, 
Okay, so uh, what, we can just give us a, a quick a quick little rundown for the people. People probably have heard of the Michelin. That just for like we're talking about again, different companies that are involved in different things. Maybe just the connection of the tire company also involved. So the tire company gives Toyota the tires for the vehicles and Lexus, and then now is really so. Just give us a quick overview of what the Michelin kind of system is for those who might not be familiar with it. Sure. So the Michelin guide started as a travel guide. I mean, I think everyone knows the Michelin man. That's a famous icon by this point. And basically, because they were a travel company, they wanted to devise a guide to, uh, to recommend high end restaurants. So what it is, is they came up with a, the ratings. It's one through three, one being the lowest, three being the highest. And basically it's it's how worthwhile is this place that you should go out of your way to eat at it? So what, like I forget exactly what they say, but something like one is like worth a detour. Two is like you know, worth more going out of the way for three is worth a, a special journey just to go here because the, the yeah. food is that exceptional, basically. And it's a little, I feel like it's a little different now because, you know, traveling's easier and all this, but it's still considered like the king of ratings. And if you get three Michelin stars, I mean, that's that's as high as you can go aside from maybe multiple James Beard awards. So in New York City, I'm trying to think, I think there's like six places or so with three stars. And mm. as far as two stars, it's like 40 something. And then one stars, it's probably like, 50 or something so if you get if you get three stars i mean you know that's that's a, that's incredibly rare and I, you know one of my heroes thomas keller he's the only american chef to get two places that each have three stars which is you know i mean every anyone else who has that is french pretty much so that says a lot <laughs> <laughs> and there is something that you're, you're mentioning yeah. that still kind of is it's carrying on that ethos of the whole destination type restaurants where now like French Laundry is probably one of the more famous uh, top. Is French Laundry three stars? Is it one, is it one star? No, it's three. Is it two yeah, stars? French, I mean? French, no, French, three laundry, star, right? French Laundry and Per Se are both three stars. That's how Keller okay. has that. Yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah, so, yeah, that's what you're, you're talking about. Yeah. So uh, Per yeah. Se, okay, so Per Se is that one. So that's, you see, with that, now they're starting to do a thing where you don't necessarily have to go to the big city anywhere. Now, so those restaurants are trying to do that whole thing where it's like, this is just a town. This is they, it's a restaurant where you actually go to the town where the French Laundry is, and you actually go there. Just It's pretty much the only, the, the biggest thing in town. I'm sure other people live around that area and have typical other jobs, plumbers and other things. But that's actually something where people can go out of the way to do something like that. And I think it's it's a positive thing that, that this is happening. Um, what do you think about that? Well, it's, it's interesting, too, because I see it actually expanded to Miami, which is recently, which I think is kind of interesting, because the concern is that in some of these other cities, the debate is the debate with the Michelin Guide, I think, that they've been having is, is it worthwhile expanding to some of these cities because they don't have enough of a population to justify these higher end restaurants? But because Miami has really been growing over the last few years and there's several high end restaurants there, I think there could be some that would get. I think they may even have one or two that could get three star, and there's probably a few that could get two star, and definitely several that could get one. So I think it's ultimately good because it'll draw more people there, and plus it'll put pressure on, or maybe maybe not pressure, but it'll motivate people to come up with better things, and that'll ultimately that could lead to better, um, better a better restaurant scene. Now I know in cities like Boston. Um, they've actually said they they haven't come there because they said the, the demographics in Boston and the small size it's not enough to support these kinds of restaurants because you figure. New York, it's what the city itself is like. Immediate area is what like ten million people or something. I should know. Twenty yeah. million. It's well, like twenty. It's well, well, twenty million. 20 when you 20 count the Connecticut, uh, yeah, Jersey, uh, PA yeah. type of connection area, I think it's yeah. But Boston, Boston proper, the population is only like half a million or something. So it's like you yeah. can't. You you don't have. I mean, you do have people with money there, obviously, but you don't have enough tourism and people with money where you can support places like Per Se, Danielle, or whatever. So, like the place I worked at in Boston, um, it's closed now, unfortunately. But they 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 were predicting if they got any ratings, it'd probably be one, maybe two stars. But you probably wouldn't see a place like Per Se up there just because it's you don't have the com the foot traffic, money there, tourism, et cetera, for it. Yeah. So it's the kind of thing where of course, a chef won't go there because the effort won't won't necessarily pay back their actual ability to get to that point. I, I, I like I, that's that's not necessarily a negative thing, but I think it, it might change. Like you said, as as travel becomes a thing where where it becomes more more common for people to travel, people might want a better different work life balance. People might figure out different ways because I can imagine that's happening. There's already rather decent restaurants. They not, might not be in the Michelin Guide type of thing that are starting to expand, and especially now post uh, post pestilence of unspoken of origin. People are starting to now leave certain areas, so money might start being out. People might start organizing different kind of ways because many of these restaurants, these bigger restaurants who were living, existing in the cities, 
they had to shut down sometimes for over a year. We talked about this in several other parts of this uh, Your We Consume series, just talking about certain restaurants that just shut down, top restaurants as well. Some haven't really opened up back up again, but they've already start, started setting up the system of having people say, okay, ahead of time, I'm going to actually come in and actually order this. I'm actually going to say, I'm going to come in at this time and come to the restaurant. Or now they might be more used to that. Some, some of you might say, okay, now I might move to, um, I'm trying to think of like a, <laughs> I'm trying to think of like a city in the, I might move to like Tennessee or something. Now it's not going to be a lot of people in Tennessee, but there's a lot of, there's an international airport. There's a lot of people coming in and out from Tennessee, that kind of area. There's still some things coming up. So just have a situation where you're working maybe less, you're not working as long, you're working maybe limited days out of the week. The rest of the time, maybe you're teaching or doing some other things, just having some regular quality of life. And that way the food can still be delivered to you. People can still book ahead of time. And there might be something that might open up with something like that. Well, I was going to add, and I think I brought this up in previous discussions too, but one thing that's really exciting is that a lot of people are working in New York and other places and going elsewhere and opening places, but they're bringing the skills and knowledge with them. So, for example, my friend, um, he's a friend actually from high school. He's the chef of this new place that opened on the Newburgh waterfront. So Newburgh, for those who don't know, it's it's along the Hudson River, but it's the opposite side of where I grew up. Uh, I grew up on the Poughkeepsie side, and it's cool. I found out that it's an Italian-oriented menu, the place is named Primo, but they're also doing um, sushi stuff in a raw bar. And apparently Apparently, one of the chefs actually worked at Masa, Masa here in the city. And for those who don't know, Masa is the place. It has three Michelin stars. Uh, the tasting menu is like 600 bucks now. The chefs who opened Netta, which was my second to last job, actually came from Masa as well. And I guess this guy, um, he was working with my friend, came from Masa as well. So he's doing more intricate, like, fruto dishes. And I think they're even going to have some sushi items. So it's pretty cool that upstate New York, you can get stuff that's – Maybe not on par with Masa, but by somebody mentored by him, so they can do things more in that direction. Yeah, yeah. that would be cool if we could find a way to get this up and going. And the other things that we're working on, we could still like a a tour around the United States of America, going to different restaurants. I'm checking out the Primo website. Shall have some dishes and things like up on this. We have uh, this particular series is the one on dish. We've also have a separate series called I Know Great People. And you're talking about people moving and, and starting their own place, taking their skills. That's also our friend Steve. He opened up Perfect Burger, the Perfect Burger Costa Rica in Costa Rica. And he has that up and going. And we had a conversation with him about that. So maybe we can get your friend to come and tell us about Primo as well. Because we're trying to get more people onto this series and things like that and just set it up where people can talk about things. Even today, this from the I Know Great People series, I'll try to be posting these food ones in specific when we have them on Mondays. And the clips from I Know Great People, there's a most important question of that thing is about cheese. So there'll be clips from <laughs> those conversations with cheese will be posted on Mondays as well, uh, wherever uh, you're listening to this. Okay, so um, is there any cookbook or any uh, any kind of uh, classes? In some of these higher end restaurants, they normally have cookbooks, but chances are they won't have classes. So do you know if there is one? Uh, not that I'm a, I'm trying to actually wait. I'm trying to think if I saw a cookbook advertised, but if I did, it was like very briefly, I'd have to go back and check. Uh, I mean, usually I noticed that thing, but I've, I've only been here once and I haven't followed them too closely. So, um, it's worth looking into though. I mean, I definitely would be interested if so, cause you have, cause you have both, um, because you have both, um, like, the, the sushi, the izakaya stuff downstairs and upstairs, you have the Creole stuff. So um, I think it would be very interesting. Hmm. Yeah, so, yeah, because that, 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 that's an interesting mix. And, yeah, you said there were borrowing some things from, the, of course, it's by Lexus is a Japanese company, so there is yeah. some relationship with that. And I wonder, this is, I, again, this is this is something, how, how old is this restaurant? Did you, did you find out? I'd have to check, actually. I think it's fairly newer because, let me see here, because, let me see here. Because I'm wondering with stuff like this, like if it's that old, maybe it's a new thing that they're testing out. Now when they test out something like this, maybe they might have some special deals. They're already in the tra in the travel industry, so maybe they're using their own vehicles. So there's a discount of actual shipping. They could they could be ways to to uh, to kind of integrate certain industries in order to have a more a more successful <laughs> more successful restaurant business. Because many businesses are really really high risk. Most businesses fail, but restaurants is another one that's very very tight margins. So maybe if you have something like this, this could be one of the different future ways that restaurants and food are going to be kind of organized it's something interesting i see i don't know if you saw it on the page here but there's also um they have an event space upstairs too which is pretty interesting so you could have an event there if you wanted as well and then there's yeah. stuff here about there's other locations there's one in dubai and there's one in tokyo so oh, okay. uh, yeah so i guess i guess it's a similar concept my sense is that they probably all have the izakaya sushi stuff but then 
the the main dining room probably depends on the chef and their background and all this. So again, if you look at this menu, it's more of the Creole stuff. Like if you're familiar with some of the New Orleans food, you'll recognize some of the dishes. Um, but then the downstairs, it's the Japanese stuff. So my sense is that's probably what they do, but I haven't checked out these other places yet. So I don't know. Yeah. yeah. All right. The taste of two Creoles. Yeah. Okay. So and now we're going to get into the food. That's been the intro. And with the food, our beautiful faces are going to go off the screen. And then the food is just going to be on the screen and you'll be able to see that. Uh, getting to the point where we're trying to set up some live streaming thing. But once we get to that point, I think we're going to get a program or some kind of platform test out some things where you can do this live. I'll do it live. I'll record it live. <laughs> we're working on that to try to improve this product, looking to mics and things like that. Okay, so uh, we'll just jump right into it. And this, as you mentioned, Stephen, this was a birthday dinner. Some of the ones that we've had, especially like seasonal, we had like a five part one. He actually worked there. There was like a Michelin one star restaurant and he actually worked there. He had like, <laughs> he had a lot of dishes. It was five parts spread out on a, on a long thing. And then we open up yeah. the desserts or the aperitivos, appetizers, amuse bouche or whatever you want to call them. Then we get into the actual main uh, entrees and the main dish and then we get to the desserts. But this one, it was a, one sit-down meal with the friend, Andrea, who will be on this series once we finish recording that thing, retting her out. She's the one who hasn't talked about this. But <laughs> let's just jump into it. I'm going to read out the names, and he normally gives me some notes sometimes. It could be some notes, could be nuts, not, but then say the names, then he'll actually go and, and let us know what the actual dish is about. So uh, starting with the first one here, and we have wasabi peas. So, yeah, not a whole lot. Not not a whole lot to say on these. These are just kind of the amused bouche. Like you sit down, they give them to you. Wasabi peas, the the darker thing. I think it's it's like a. I forget if it's made with nori. It's one of the seaweeds. It's like a cracker kind of, but it's flavored with that. So it's like a little salty. Mm -hmm. um, there's sesame seeds. It's funny. My dad used to always buy these growing up, so I always thought of him. Um, he, he's into a lot of. He's like my dad is something of a Japanophile. I don't know if I mentioned <laughs> this to you. He, uh, he well, he's he, he's been watching since he retired. He's been watching the Japanese channel, and now he's watching sumo wrestling regularly. It's kind of funny. <laughs> so like, does, he's, he, does he watch he's, anime? I don't think I don't think so. He's more interested in the food and sumo wrestling. He's like, oh, I gotta watch the sumo champion okay. son. But, uh, but he always <laughs> he he always he always got these growing up. And um, I think Trader Joe's sells them, and he got them from other places. So you know, pretty good, nice little snack. Wasabi, of course, strong wakes up the palate. For those who don't know, I think most people who watch this stuff would know. But it's the Japanese horseradish. It's a bright green color, uh, very strong. Yeah, and the peas are dried. Yeah. Okay, so the bright green color, but then uh, the way they've prepared it. You see, the peas are covered with it. So why is it whitish here? Is it is that this? Uh, what's That's that a good question. That's a good question. My guess is they probably mix other stuff into it to stretch it out because I, I've had fresh wasabi root at Netta. It's this bright green color and it's mm -hmm. very expensive. So you can only use a little bit because it's not grown here. They have to import it. Um, but it's this is definitely lighter. I'm not 100 percent sure why the stuff because a lot of the stuff you get in sushi places, it's it's usually mass produced. Like it's it's real wasabi, but they usually like put it into tubes, they add stuff to preserve it basically, and then you just shoot it out and put it on plates. So like places like, like Netta, for example, use that as well as the fresh wasabi, but the fresh wasabi was only on certain dishes because it's a pricier yeah. item. It's sort of it's sort of like getting truffles fresh versus like canned or jarred or something. Like it's still the item, but it's it's gonna lose the quality, but it's also gonna be cheaper. So realistically it's like you couldn't put fresh truffles on everything. I mean you'd go out of business. So it's similar with wasabi, I think. Yeah. Now how hot was this? Was it super hot? Because wasabi is normally very hot. Maybe there's different times of well wasabi. Because yeah, I know it's something like ginger in the United States of America when you get ginger, yeah. stuff's like blind it's completely white. And like what is what is this thing? Yeah. Here when you get ginger here in Nairobi, Kenya, it's it's um it's greenish, greenish yellow. It's like really kind of deep greenish yellow, almost close to like what actual wasabi is. Some of them are really that dark. So I, I, it's it's just weird to me when I when I get to America and I see these white ginger roots. I'm like, what is this thing? So maybe it's some kind of a cultivar or some kind of different one. Yeah, or they or they in this in this case with this dish, maybe they add something to it, like I say, to stretch it out, and that weakens the flavor a little bit. But they see it as like we don't need fresh wasabi because it's just a snack and. It's not supposed to be overly spicy either because the dish like we had a netto with the fresh wasabi, you just grated a little bit like you didn't cover the thing because it would just be way too much. Yeah. All right. Yeah. And also, maybe because um, like this again, another one I'm just going to go on this, even, even on the roots type of thing, there's sweet potatoes. Some of them are white. Some of them are orange, bright orange, and then some of them more purplish. And they all taste 
kind of sweet potato. It is not really that big of a fluctuation between them. So you can still have that. And I, again, I don't have to ask you, sorry if you mentioned it, but you said it wasn't that, that hot of a, of a natural thing, right? No, no. I mean, it's it's spicy, like you'll taste it, but it's not overbearing. I mean, I don't eat a lot of spicy stuff, and for me, it was fine. Um, so it's like this is not supposed to be like a hot pepper that knocks you over or something, you know? So. Yeah. Yeah, then like you said, good chance it's just something, maybe it's something intentionally made to kind of knock down also just the heat, the, the, the yeah. fire, the fire, <laughs> the spiciness from the actual dish. Okay, now moving on to the next one here, we have olives and these olives dishes. Uh, this olive is also with some chili, citrus, and sesame. Yeah, not, again, not a whole lot to say about this either. This is just a small plate you can get. It was funny. Andrea actually thought the zest was cheese and tried to eat it at first. I was like, no, 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 that's orange zest. Don't eat that. Um, but it's it's a little little more depth of flavor. Chili makes it a little spicier. The zest, you can take, taste sort of the citrus overtones as well as the smell. Um, just, you know, something different with olives because a lot of places just put out olives just out of a jar and it's like whatever. But this has a little more depth because you get the brininess, the spice, and you get a little bit of the orange too. So... This this is a nice amused bouche as well, and uh, and oh, and some uh, and some sesame too. Yeah, I'm not too big a fan of olives, but also I'm not too big a fan of these places, these high fluting places. Put something on the plate, I'm going to eat it. <laughs> I uh, shall attempt to eat whatever you put on that plate. <laughs> you need to do a better job. Then. So they give you these kind of little skewer type of things to kind of pick out on it. Uh, now something like this, you, you, this is some of the things we've talked about this with some of these, especially the higher end of restaurants. They'll have certain ingredients that they keep on on menu that because they'll try to use these in several things. Now this is a limited amount of dishes that we've seen at this time, so we're not going to necessarily see that over time. But when we've talked about some of the restaurants, you see like, okay, they have olives. Then something like this, this looks like a thing where they could have olives on hand throughout the year. But then now the different things they make in this kind of preparation style, they can switch out some different things. Or is that something that you can kind of imagine with this? When you had this, have you had something similar with olives? Have you thought, what thoughts did this kind of evoke to you? I mean, not a whole lot, because usually olives, like I said, I either eat straight or I eat them in a dish. Like I had um, quinoa with olives in them, and they're also raisins. So it, like it sort of gives a different depth of flavor because you have the quinoa, there's a little bit of butter, there's the sweetness of the dried raisins, then there's... Um, you know, the brawniness of the olives. So it's like, I've, I think it's it's cool to use olives as something as a component or add other things to it rather than just straight brine because it's like, again, it's kind of boring. <laughs> mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. yeah, that's the thing. They look for the flavor combination, combinations, different uh -huh. kind of mouthfeels. You're hardly ever going to find something served at this high restaurant. It's just like once, it's just, it's just a crunchy thing or it's just, yeah. it's just, it's just a kind of a creamy type of things. They'll always want to have, they'll try to always have some kind of different mixes here, at least on the flavors or the textures and things like that, but yeah. Okay. Sure. And also excellent dish. This is another thing that you'll see at some of these higher end of places. They'll take a lot of thought into the plating and things like that, that will be involved. Okay. Yeah. Also, I don't no. know if I mentioned I don't know if I mentioned this before, but I have an iPhone 13 now. My last one was an eight, so the quality of these photos is a lot better. Uh, hmm. Andrea has Andrea has an Android. It's probably even better still. But the, I'm, I'm comparing the recent photos I've been taking to the ones from months ago, and it's just like they look a lot better. A lot more <laughs> yeah. yeah. There's a lot. There's a lot more detail. It's much clearer, and it just it looks much nicer to see be able to put these up rather than the other ones. I mean, my last camera wasn't terrible. I mean, if especially if I go back years, like when we did seasonal, when I had that really obsolete <laughs> yeah. phone. But um, but the, the cameras have gotten a lot better, and it's really nice to see. Yeah. yeah, we shall continue again to try to improve this, and we'll also get a location. Now, you can definitely check out also Stephen's own uh, Instagram. He posts a lot of these things as well, and some other extremist content that might trigger the, the <laughs> certain kinds of minds. Be warned, <laughs> and adult mentality required for checking out that page. But yeah, he has that, and we will, we'll, we're looking to get more of this. So we, we'll try to get some location where you can just go in and get just the pictures and other things like that and start to get links to actual dishes and things as we expand on this uh, platform and get other people joining us. Okay, so here we have the Caesar crudite, and um, it's uh, koibari, no, kol, kolbari, kolrabi, kolrabi, yeah. uh, radish, and uh, market vegetables. So crudite, so it's, it's kind of a crudite. play as you... As you can kind of tell, it's, it's kind of a play on Caesar salad, so the dressing is more Caesar. Mm. Um, it's that kind of flavor. My guess is instead of anchovies, there's probably fish sauce or something in it because it's, you know, an Asian, it's Asian-inspired. Uh, obviously, the vegetables here are on ice. 
Kohlrabi, for those who don't know, it translates. It comes from um, German. Kohl is another word for cabbage, and Rabi is actually a Swiss-German word for turnip. So it's a cross between a cabbage and turnip. That's where the name comes from. And, it, of course, there's some uh, multicolored carrots here. There's... Um, peppers radish all this just kind of you know dip this into dip this into the dressing here and eat it just i guess it's like i don't know if deconstructed caesar salad is the right comparison because i mean it's the dressing but there's no croutons and stuff but i guess like it's kind of inspired by that so yeah. deconstructed caesar salad yeah because the crudite the crudite could be crudite 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 could be, yeah. like, crudite could be crude like kind of just raw or rough so that could be something yeah. that's kind of a different term to go for the same kind of idea there. This is something that is gain, seems to be gaining popularity as people are trying different things. And now with the market vegetables, the market vegetables can, of course, uh, switch around. So how how did you all attack this dish? You just take a dish, you dip it in, and then you kind of uh, use your hands and, and finger type of finger food? Yeah, because that, that's where I was sort of saying the de deconstructed, because Caesar salad, typically, you t when you serve a Caesar salad, you figure you toss the romaine in the dressing and then put it on the plate, whereas this, it's separate. So the idea is you can just dip it in, like, however much or however little you want. I mean, just sort of that. Like I said, there's just, there's no croutons, but I mean, and the, well, and the vegetables have changed too, but it's similar idea. Yeah. Interesting. And we got some ice shavings in there to keep it chilled. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, I, <laughs> I think we yeah. can jump on to the next one. Uh, okay, now we have, oh, you didn't tell us about this, but you can, as, as you tell us about this particular one, which is the kava. I've heard yep. this name before. I heard this word before. It's like, ah, kava, I drank this. <laughs> okay, so can you tell us a bit about this? And also, we didn't talk about the drinks and the wine selection in wine. And I, I in the menu, saw some cocktails and things like this. So tell us a bit about this and also the wine and drink selection at, at the restaurant. Yeah, so they they actually had a pretty interesting list. They have um they had quite a few wines. Re um, well, this was in the lounge. I don't know about. It. I'm sure the fine dining room probably has more stuff. But um, they have a bunch of whites, a bunch of reds. They have uh some some stuff that's a little off the beaten path. Like they have some Basque wine. When we talked about Huertas, Huertas is a Basque themed place. So you have that. You have those names written in that different dialect with the X's and stuff. I thought that was kind of interesting. They have a few sakes as well. I was debating on getting sake because I haven't had it in a while. They only had like two of them though. Uh, but like I say, the lounge is more casual, so that makes sense. Um, I think they have like one or two beers, and of course they have like soda or juice. Uh, this I thought was good because the cava, the cava rosé, cava is a sparkling Spanish wine. Um, there's typically um, three grapes that are used. It's the uh, my, my Spanish isn't the best, but I think it's Macabeo, uh, Parayada, and uh, Haralo. Yeah, I'd, I'd have to talk, but I think this, but basically it's it's one of those, like, it's white or red, um, it's white or rosé typically. This one's rosé. I, I got it personally because I thought it went well with, like, a lot of this food is not overly light or overly intense, so it's kind of that mm -hmm. middle of the road where it works with those. And um, it's just a very easy-to-drink wine. I thought it was nice. Um People used to call it Spanish champagne, but there's been some pushback against that because, <laughs> you know, it, it's not champagne, champagne, and, you know, so. <laughs> yeah. yeah, they don't need to do that. That's, yeah. that's a thing that I think people are becoming more well-versed in things, calling things what they are. You you can't just identify things or whatever. You don't have to just, no, every every wine can't identify as champagne. Things are what they are, uh, according, at, at least with some realistic people. Okay, now I'm seeing, this is uh, the marble table, so... I'm seeing in the background here there's some couches and things like that. So was it yeah. were you guys sitting on couches? You said it was a lounge, so it wasn't like this regular like wooden type of tables. So it wasn't like hard seats and things like that. So it's, yeah, it's exactly. The lounge you either sit on couches or uh, chairs like this, like because it's more casual. That's why you know smaller cool. menu and yeah, there's there's a little bar area. I don't think you can sit at it. I think it's just a service bar. But then it's like you just sit at these couches or tables and they just run the stuff out and drop it off for you. Yeah. Okay. Now here's and jumping on to the next one, rather exciting looking presentation here. Again, the yeah. platings are done really well. And here we have some uh, skewers. Um, one of them is with tiger prawns, and that's with lemongrass, ginger, chili, and cashew. And then one is with duck, and that goes with enoki mushrooms and plum glaze. And then one is pork meatball, and that goes with foie gras. There we go. <laughs> and garam masala glaze. So tell us a bit about this. So this this is yakitori. Uh, there, I went a while back with Andrea and Abraham to this. Yeah, yakitori, yeah. I went I went a while back. There's a place in the West Village. I went with Andrea and Abraham. It's called Village Yokocho, and it's similar stuff, but it's much more casual. So they have like, I think they have like beef cheek on skewers. They have like 
chicken hearts, all this, it's like a lot cheaper. Whereas this is kind of similar stuff, but obviously more intricate, more uh, higher end. I think we tried most of the skewers. I mean, the lounge menu, maybe we could put post it at some point. Um, the lounge menu itself isn't that big. So it's like the lounge is probably usually somewhere you would go and hang out briefly or go before you go somewhere else. Cause it's not a huge menu. I mean, great food, but like only a few items and the portions aren't big. So tiger prawns here. I think that's obvious. The, the prawn are like the bigger shrimp with um, the lemongrass is I, I think it's cut up very it's cooked down a lot because lemongrass if you have it in its natural state it's very tough very fibrous like you do not want to be chewing on lemongrass you usually strain it out <laughs> of things ginger chili I think that's self-explanatory um, cashew it's sort of broken up over top and there's a little bit of amaranth the microgreen sprinkled on top the duck uh, I think it's the duck breast sliced very thin it's wrapped around enoki mushrooms those are those very thin little mushrooms in the middle and then the plum glaze just over top my guess is they probably they probably take the breast they probably cut it wrap it around the mushrooms um, glaze it with the plum glaze and sort of hit it with heat just to cook it enough because it's you know it's not a super thick piece so it probably cooks pretty quickly. And then on the end here, I think you could tell uh, pork meatball, foie gras, thin little slices on top with a bunch of chives. And then garam marsala glaze, that's actually on the atop of the foie gras. For those those who don't know, garam marsala, it's basically a Amazing. spice. Yeah, it's a spice blend. It's um, it's from Southeast Asia, typically like India, Pakistan, Nepal, Bangladesh, Indian subcontinent, basically. Mm -hmm. And it's sort of, I think it's sort of like uh, curry or something where it's one of those like, it, it it has like a typical composition, but like people swap out different things. So typically mm -hmm. it's like fennel, bay leaf, peppercorns, cloves, cinnamon, uh, maize, cumin, coriander, red chili, cardamom. But again, it's one of those things where like some people will take something out, add something else. They'll add more things. They'll take two things out, add something like it, it's. It, I remember a chef in school was saying it's almost like fried chicken. Like everyone has like their <laughs> recipe, or you know, it's kind of like that. Yeah. So um, I'm not sure what was in this one, but you definitely taste some of those kinds of spices. So probably that yeah. category. Yeah. With garam masala, yeah, that's that's a, it's relatively common here in Kenya because of course for those of people probably even know. When uh, Kenya was colonized by the British, yeah. they already had colonized uh, India, so they brought over a significant number of Indian people to kind of work with the locals and just work on different things. And after independence, those Ken those Indians who were also here had been multi generational. They also became Kenyan. So, and then they still had the connection to the family. So there's a pipeline. Kenya has about 45 million people. Um, I would say about. A million people of recent Indian origin, some a lot fewer, maybe 10% of those have come like later, but then multi, many of them are multi-generational who consider themselves as Kenyan as any rando and more Negro Kenyan that you would actually find and meet. So yeah, that's mm -hmm. it's, it's, with them, they've brought a lot of spices to spice up the, in, in one thing I've noticed in part of the reason certain countries don't have developed a cuisine where it's just cooking, it's really hearty type of cooking. They just didn't get to the point of the time where they had enough of a civilization to go into certain kinds of preparations for certain things. Food was relatively abundant. You actually had access to certain food or you didn't, or you were still in like the hunter gatherer type of kind of situation. So you didn't have time to go in. And that's part of the you know, where you consume series, we've talked about how do, how do dishes develop? How does something come to be something that's higher end cuisine versus just something that's just regular roughage? Because some of these things you see at these Michelin three stars, it, it did start by just probably, in many cases, some woman just making some food, some mother making some food for the dish, and then slowly by slowly, it just kind of gets upped, 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 upped. Some of them, as we've mentioned, somebody was trying to preserve something in a specific way, and doing that preservation thing, they found a way to get some taste out of something, some flavor out of something that wasn't done before, that they kind of developed that and, and work on that. Sure. But yeah. So this yakitori, I'm also seeing here the enoki mushrooms. Definitely want to look up and see what that is. So with foie, how was the foie? Tell us a bit about the foie. Very good. Um, I thought it was interesting. It was a very small slice, which worked well for the portion here. Um, it just sort of it, it's it, it adds a different texture because you figure the meatballs, the meatballs a bit milder, the foie is a little fattier, so there's different textures going on. I think the foie is probably a little softer as well, and then the spice blend works well with both. Yeah, and then the chives on top. A lot of there were a lot of chives on top, but it actually worked pretty well. <laughs> so I don't know. I I think I mean chives look nice on the plate. I I think some people overdo it, but I mean I I think for the intense flavors here, it was it worked. You know. Yeah. yeah, this is one of the things when you read manga and watch anime, they, they do the food stuff a lot. But that's a common thing in books when you start getting certain things. Even like the George R R Martin 
Uh, not so much in actually Lord of the Rings. That might be something that's more recent. Maybe you need to read more Western type of uh, story stuff. But they don't do it in Western comic books. That's definitely something that isn't done anywhere close to as much as they'll do food in uh, manga. Even if it's not like, the, even if the food's not about, even something like a food manga, they'll just have like a manga and it's like oh, this amazing kind of dish of it. Some of them go into specific like food wars. Some people might know about that. Toriko, it was like this gourmand wars with like these kind of powers and stuff like that. You have things like, does this one in the dungeon? It's about like dungeon exploring, like a dungeon and dragon type of thing. But while they're going deep, dipping into the dungeons, they actually find different ingredients. Like they make like um, crazy, they, they kill crazy animals and things like that, like sphinxes. And then they make some weird type of like high end dish with like the sphinxes and the different mushrooms, like talking, walking mushrooms that they found. And they actually put a recipe. So they use these fant fantastical creatures and ingredients, but the recipes they actually list in the actual book are using actual real life goods that you can actually go out and actually make yourself. So this is a lot of kind of cool things that that's involved with that. And speaking of mushrooms, these Anoki mushrooms are really cool looking. I like the look of them. Yeah, and I've mentioned it a few times, but that's what's interesting about the Red Wall series because it's like these anthropomorphic animal animals are kind of this mythical setting but then the dishes are all like real dishes and then they actually yeah. like they're based off classical english dishes and they have recipes which i thought i thought was kind of cool so it's like you know here's here's root vegetable pie here's <laughs> pie, or, but it's like oh yeah those are things that people actually eat <laughs> yeah good stuff and we will we'll focus and, and do that to might start looking into that and i've taken some screen caps of things i actually want to try making might do a separate one where we come back we have scheduled to talk about that book and I'll, I'll see if i can make a short listing of some things that i've seen in manga and things like that that we can also kind of talk and maybe test out eventually um okay so yeah yeah, Kitori. Okay, so um, moving on to the next one here. Yep. And here we have an A5 Wagyu and uh, with mustard, crispy garlic, soy caramel, tamaki roll. Hmm. Sure. So for those who don't know, uh, Wagyu is the breed of cow. People mix up Kobe and Wagyu beef. Wagyu is the breed of cow. Then Kobe is the specific, the beef from the region fed the specific diet, given the treatment, all that. That's the cow that gets the massage, the sake, the sake hops, okay. all that. It's sort of like champagne versus sparkling wine. Like, you know, all champagne is sparkling wine, but it's only champagne if it's from that region. These grapes made method champenoise, all that. It's kind of like that. So uh, this is the, but this is the breed itself. But A5 is the highest grade there is, so there's the highest fat content. And it's really interesting because if you look at the beef when it's raw, it looks almost like charcuterie or something. Like there's so <laughs> marble all through. Yeah, it's so marble all throughout. Um, It'll be on the screen right it, now for those of you watching the video version. This is the tamaki roll I was talking about. So I've also had maki rolls. I think tamaki, the thing is that the difference is it's open like this, whereas the maki roll, it's just kind of like a hand roll that's rolled up, like usually in the shape of a cone. Um, soy caramel, I think that's self-explanatory. You know, it complements the beef, crispy garlic. It's sliced very thin and fried. A little bit of mustard just to sort of offset it. So you have like, you know, you have the sugar, the salt, mustard, and then the beef, which is, it's cooked all the way through, but super tender because of what it is. Yeah. Yeah. This is, again, an, a very interesting. I've seen these kind of uh, triangular type of things they put here. I've seen them using it at, at like some taco, places serving tacos as kind of a um, different way to present some of these things. But yeah, now I can imagine this is one where they can also just switch things out, right? And uh, with these dishes, did, did y'all did all have this? Were these things that you both shared? Did you taste both of them? Like, um, what's going so on? So the the duck we both like with the skewers we both wanted that so we we got two orders of it but then like the foie and um, meatball that was me and then she wanted the prawn but it was like we each like had like a part of each of the other one um, and then let me see here and then not the next roll but the one after that was her I didn't get to try it and then the desserts we just both shared because there's only two desserts and we figured like let's just get both and share them so okay um, so now I have the soy caramel. Um... You're saying soy caramel is straightforward. So I'm thinking they just do this regular thing of caramel where with caramel, it's just, it's milk, butter, and honey or sugar. Then you yeah. then you reduce it. So do they switch out this, the milk with soy? Um, my sense is they probably, you probably, what you do is you put some water in a pan so that way the sugar doesn't burn, but then it starts to like gradually, it heats up enough that it browns. And then instead of putting, um, it's a good question because usually the it's cream, the milk, not milk, right? It's cream. Yeah, the cre the cream usually sort of thins it out, and that's what keeps it from burning any further, as well as it gives it the texture. Um, I don't know that there was any dairy in this, and also you have to be careful because if you put if if you melt if you melt sugar really hot like on its own, and you put like liquid in it, it'll explode. <laughs> so wow. my my sense is that they probably. 
they probably do sugar. They probably do just enough water so it browns but doesn't get over the top. And then they probably add a little more water just to keep it from keep it sort of in that state. And they probably add a little bit of soy just to make it salty. And then they brush that over top. That'd be my guess. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Cool, cool. Yeah, interesting dish. It looks definitely yeah. appealing. It looks rustic because some people might say it's a rustic looking dish. Uh, <laughs> then yeah, you have the different mouthfeels and the different rice. Um, that's rice under there. You said yeah. So yeah. yeah. This is this Japanese sushi rice and different kinds of rices out there. Good, good looking dish. Yeah, because yeah, because the ma the maki roll or tamaki roll, like I say, it's a hand roll. Usually, it's they roll it up and then they cut it and put the pieces down. But for this, it's like they'll just take a piece of nori, the rice, and just sort of like either roll it up or fold it like this and just give it to you, and then you just grab it. Yeah. Hmm. yeah. And now we're jumping on to the next one. Moving on to the next one here, we have the tuna tamaki roll, and this is ginger scallion and gochujang. Gochujang. Yeah. So this 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 was this was another one I ordered. This was very interesting. So the tuna is cut up almost like a tartar. Uh, gochujang, for those who don't know, that's a Korean. Um, it's a Korean item, actually. I told Kimchi wife, aka base Korean lady, about this. She thought it was cool. It's um it's actually a fermented product. Like well, kimchi is fermented as well, but it's let's see um it's like chilies there's rice there's garlic there's usually sugar salt in it it's a very um potent product because it's you figure those items plus it's fermented so it's pretty strong it's usually the kind of item that you mix in with other things just to sort of give it some flavor um and then scallion on top and then these were i think these were little rice puffs i'm not 100 percent sure by the texture they seem like rice balls like you somehow work rice into like a Sort of like you you work rice into almost this like starchy kind of like texture. Then I think you make little balls and dry them out, and then that that's like a crunch when you bite into it. Yeah. Yeah, that looks it looks like a tom, like a kind of a tomato paste here. Interesting. Yeah. So it's mixing it. That that those flavors probably would work well yeah. really well together. Yeah. Yeah, I can imagine Cause, that. Because I think the gochujang is um it's strong enough, but tuna because it's a slightly richer fish it sort of balances it well if you use a little bit whereas i think if you were to put it on like a white fish or something it'd be too strong yeah 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 this, this looks really good <laughs> yeah. i was like so i have some canned tuna downstairs we're gonna have for dinner later and i'm like ah man this, is, this looks a little better <laughs> this is way better uh -huh. <laughs> and that kind of canned tuna type of music yeah, yeah, but yeah. Um, yeah, I love to personally. I love tuna either raw or rare. Like I don't like. I mean, I don't like it well done. Like I had this discussion with my father because I tried to serve him uh, rare tuna and he like freaked out. But he's very big <laughs> on cooking. He's very big on cooking. But I, for me, I just like it because it's a much milder flavor. And um, if it's seared on the outside, it's nice. Like if you do like the blackening spices, like you can sear it on the outside and then it's like deep red and it's almost like steak or something. It's really nice. Yeah. 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 yeah, tuna, tuna is great. Tuna, but I don't know. I, hmm. I'm kind of thinking I would, I would prefer to have a good piece of salmon over a good piece of tuna still. But maybe I, I've, I've had a lot more salmon than I've had tuna. And I could just be, eh, it, it, it's, it, maybe it's how the tuna has been prepared or the quality of the tuna, whereas salmon, you can get re relatively decent salmon regardless of where you get it from. And I, th I think also, I think the, the certain, certain French, certain French uh, actor <laughs> from Chicago who was mm -hmm. found guilty of certain felony, certain French actor <laughs> kind of convicted felon. I think when they went to Subway, I think it's, people were kind of wondering like, what, what's, what's that? Someone was like, I'm wondering what actual sandwich did you get? I think it was a tuna sandwich. We also think he was talking about it. Like, hey, you need to get protein. Oh man, that, that, was, a, that was a crazy story. <laughs> that guy, that guy. Juicy sommelier. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> oh man. Anyway, moving. <laughs> Such a ridiculous individual. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I'm sorry. I just recorded a long video going over what the people are saying, and I'm still laughing just thinking about it. Oh man. Okay. <laughs> this is homophobic. I don't care what you say. <laughs> <laughs> well <laughs> okay 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 um sorry be, be professional be, be free this, this actually it's not professional this is our profession to just shoot the dish the dish like this okay so the next one back to the food seaweed tamaki roll with cucumber kombu and nori jam yeah i didn't actually get to try this one um this was something she ordered so as far as I can tell, I mean, there's 
kombu is the seaweed. It's typically it's like um, kelp. It's usually simmered in things. Nori jam. I guess the nori is cut up. It's simmered with something. It's cooked down almost like a jam. Again, I didn't get to try it. A um, little bit of cucumber, a little bit of avocado. Actually, no, I think that's just straight cucumber. Yeah, there's no, no avocado, a little sesame and more nori on top. I, I didn't I didn't try any of it. I, I mean, it didn't look super exciting to me. Maybe it was good, but <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. I mean, I guess she seemed to enjoy it, so I can't really say. Yeah. The presentation, I mean, it definitely looks, it, it's, I mean, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's an interesting presentation, the kind of little nest above it and things like that. Yeah, yeah uh, this is nothing to do with kombucha at all. It's, it's, it's a whole different thing. Uh, but kombucha is, yeah, there's something rather, so the kombucha is that that hot sauce that's kind of famous in the states, right? Come, it's made Wait. in the it's made in California. Wait, kombucha? It's, you no, mean kom the kombucha? The drink, the fermented tea type of drink. Type of drink. Kombucha is a fermented drink, yeah. Oh yeah, what am I thinking? I'm thinking sriracha. Okay, sriracha is the, the hot sriracha, sauce. Yeah. Yeah. So kombucha is yeah that fermented drink, and this has nothing to do with that, right? No, it has no. nothing to do with kombu. If I'm not mistaken, but yeah, I'll be on the screen kombucha. And for the first time, I had some of my friends in New York City um, was had made her own. It was it's interesting. It's kind of like fermented cider of sorts and things like that. I think you would use an apple. But yeah. All right. So anything? Yeah. Uh, what did Andrea say about it? If if anything, she seemed to like it. I mean, I didn't really ask much. Uh, I didn't really ask much more about it. I mean, like I said, it didn't excite me terribly. I mean, it's the kind of thing that like. If someone offered to me it to me, I'd eat it, but it's like I wouldn't pick it off of, <laughs> off of a menu. Yeah, I wouldn't pick it off of a menu. Yeah. Okay. So on to the next one. This is now on to the desserts. And this is a Concord grape, uh, creme de cassis, foam and hackberry compote and uh pop rocks. Pop rocks like from the packet pop rocks. That yeah, yep. we used to say yeah. drink with, with with soda, you'd explode. The things yeah. the things we used to believe. That's the thing. Realize some of just look in the past and imagine the things that you believed when you were a kid. And then realize that people who are, might be of adult age are essentially children on like 99.99999% of the things. But even worse than children, they have those few things that they have their adult knowledge of to reinforce the fact that they think that they're correct about the things they believe. And that's why this certain French actor was actually still to this day believed for, <laughs> for his tuna subway sandwich kind of run at night. So tell us a bit about this dessert. Yeah, so I forget the name of this, but there's a Japanese dessert where it's like shredded ice and then the other stuff is on top of it and you sort of mix it together. So like think of something like a snow cone, except the ingredients are separate and you mix it together and eat it a whole. Um, so the creme de cassis, for those who don't know, that's actually um, it's a liquor made from black currants. Um, so it's actually um, it's a foam made out of that. I'm not sure what else was in here. My sense is dairy and somehow it was aerated. Um, hackberry compote. I'd actually never tried hackberries before. They're kind of interesting. Um they almost reminded me a little bit of like, I don't know if I'm going to say a cross between grapes and blueberries, maybe like more in that direction, like kind of like round, like they're they're more round. They're not shaped like grapes, but then they have kind of like a thicker skin, um, definitely sweeter. Um, so that's that's mixed in. And then there's uh, the Pop Rocks. The candy was actually on top. So as you eat it, you hear you feel it like, you know, popping in your mouth. Yeah, it's really interesting dessert. Um she got she got the other one. I actually preferred uh, I preferred this one to the other one, but um, the other one's nice too. Yeah, I think if I'm not mistaken, I could be wrong. I think the name of that thing is kakigori, and this is a kakigori type of thing here. Where I've seen this again. I've seen definitely seen this in manga. When you said that, I've seen that in manga, and recently there's like Komi san Komi can't communicate new manga, and there's a scene where her and her father. They, they have issues talking and they go out to a restaurant and they have some kakigori and then so it's a, it's a nice it's a nice hearty moment but this is definitely something that I have seen and occasionally when I get into my YouTube uh, <laughs> rabbit holes I just start clicking on food videos or going to different things there's one where I did go to around to a not, lot where they actually get, did this and one of the common ones is that one they have like some greenish type of stuff I forget what the actual is but yeah kakigori is one name that I'm seeing with this um, yeah Japanese summer is frozen dessert. So they just put different kind of toppings on it, the shaved ice stuff type of thing. Yeah, no, this is something that, again, I'm sure they can keep it on the menu and then just switch things around as the seasons change, right? Yeah. Um, there's, all, there's only two desserts, like I said, so I figured we'd each get, we'd each get one and just share. <laughs> okay. So this, uh, before we go, I just want to get the hackberry on the screen so I can see what the hell that hackberry looks like. I'm interested in all these things. I want to get and try all these. Got to try them all. Got to catch them all. Got to eat them all. 
I had never um, heard of Hackberry till this. Yeah, it was interesting. <laughs> yeah, it looks like this is some kind of this bland looking berries. Uh, did you, sorry, I might have not been paying enough attention, but did you say kind of what it tastes like, which berries are kind of close to it for people who haven't had Hackberry sound? Yeah, I was saying it almost reminds me of a cross between like a grape, grape and a uh, blueberry or something. Like it almost like grape the flavor is close. Like the flavor is closer to a blueberry, but it has that like thicker skin that you kind of chew on like a grape. Um, so okay. I don't know if I had, I'm not sure like, but there's other stuff in there too. So I'd have to like taste it raw versus with sugar and see how that changes it as well. Plus there's conquered grape in there. So maybe there's, you know, some influence there. Yeah. Um, true. Yeah. Yeah. Um, that's the thing. It's one thing. I want to say people need to plant more trees. <laughs> they really need to plant trees. Trying to get in this project to plant the trees. I think whenever I'm doing something, I'm like just like just plant trees, get some kind of thing. It just and just the amount of seeds that people throw out. They just get all these fruits and you eat. I know in certain locations when you have certain uh, companies, the food you get has been somehow denatured or de neutered in some way. They neuter the, the fruits that you eat where you, you actually planted the seed of that actual fruit or, or vegetable. It wouldn't actually grow. Or in some cases, they found ways to patent things where if you actually planted it, like you could get sued for doing it. Those are some of the absurd things that I see with like certain copyright laws and intellectual property and things like that. I don't think that's something that should be able to be copyrighted and things like that. But uh, anyway, so um, now we're do you ever see the tree that? Do you ever see the sorry. fruit that the uh, fruit tree that has all the different fruits grafted onto it? That's one of my favorites because oh, cool. they took a pic. They took a pic. I'll, I'll try to find a photo of it for you, but it was really cool because they found um, they they took a picture in springtime, so all the blossoms. So you see like white blossoms, like orange blossoms, like uh bluish ones yeah it's really cool oh wow um if you're yeah. looking at multi-grafted fruit trees such as growing yeah let's see if you can see this uh this might it's be like... some of the pictures no this one is completely wrong see like a completely photoshop thing that has like <laughs> what is this a monstrosity they have like bananas and like guavas and pears and like no bananas don't grow on trees like this <laughs> it doesn't work uh, I'm thinking, yeah, you, if you can find the picture, I'm thinking 40, uh, 40 knowledge, tree of 40. So we'll, we'll I'll, just, I'll just take a screen cap here. So this might be it, might not be it, but they seeing one here with like white, pink, dark red. But you'll send me that picture and we'll, we'll have it up on the screen because that sounds pretty freaking awesome. Well, at yeah, least you can definitely possibly do it with different strains. Like you have like, uh, you can have like Granny Smith apples or like Pink Lady apples in the same apple tree. That'd probably be something that would be relatively, um, that wouldn't like, wouldn't reject it. Yeah, it's like I think like if you try to do like an orange in an apple tree, it would not work. But if you do yeah. like you like you say like similar apple trees, like maybe if you do like a few pear varieties, like maybe Bosque pear or the Anjou pear or something like that. Yeah. Okay, now on to the last one and uh, happy early. Yeah, this will be posted before her birthday and happy birthday to you, Andrea. And Good. this was a happy birthday dish for it. And this was passion fruit. Passion fruit, amazing. Love passion fruit. Love the smell of the fruit, love the flower of the fruit. L-U-V, not like L-O-V-E, because that term is overused. Gotta be specific with that word, my pet piece. And, uh, okay, coconut, yuzu foam, ginger, uh, kabosu, and uh, pineapple. That sounds yeah, like an amazing flavor combination. I mean, I don't know what the, the kabosu is, but ginger, coconut, and pineapple, those three things go really well together. Yeah, so I want to say, too, they did a very nice job of after I made the reservation, I included, I said, it's my friend's birthday. And they said, what is your friend's name? And when we, when we arrived, this card was actually sitting on the table. Oh, wow. I thought that was that was a very nice touch, I thought. Yeah. And all right. So Yuzu, for those who don't know, Japanese lemon, I think of it as kind of a cross between lemon. It has kind of an evergreen element to it. Uh, Kabosa is actually a similar one. It's a little different, though. The Yuzu, I want to say, is yellow in color. Kabosa is green. Um, flavor profile is fairly close. Ginger, and then um, there's actually pet, there's fresh passion fruit in here. Like you actually get like the seeds and like the pieces of fruit as well Excellent. as pineapple. Yeah, the the uh, pineapple. I think it's candied or something. A similar thing. So it's sort of the inverse of what I had. Whereas I had it was the ice and the stuff on top. This is the stuff at the bottom and ice on top. But both cases you just sort of mix it together. Um, this one was nice too. I prefer I preferred the one that I had, but I thought this was nice. A lot of really good flavors. Yeah. Okay, so <laughs> I mean that that does sound delicious. I was I was just looking up for kabosu because I was like getting some pictures up on the screen, and uh, that is the name of Doge of the Doge dog. Mm -hmm. 
the Doge dog yeah. for the memes that is the the that is the the mascot for Dogecoin. His name is Kabosu. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah. that's kind of cute. Uh, but yeah, so yeah. we'll see on the screen. We'll see Doge, and you'll also see some um, some Kabosu uh, out there. Yeah, it looks like it looks like a type of lemon that is that was grand common, like a mix of orange and lemon. Yeah, it's it's interesting. But yeah, that's that's yeah. it. And with the desserts, as we've mentioned, as I've mentioned before, that I like kind of going and looking that wasn't necessarily there in the first one is the four C's of desserts, citrus, caramel, coffee, and chocolate. And this one has the citrus in it, but the and grapes kind of, sort of, kind of count uh, the citrusy type of fruits. Maybe we can start uh, to you're, it's I'd, okay. I'd say that's a reach, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's reaching there, but yeah, we, we'll, we'll give them a pass on that. But yeah, that's... But you, could all, you could also argue, though, that this isn't the full-fledged restaurant because this is like the lounge where it's like you maybe get snacks or small plates. Like, I'd, I'd imagine... A lot of people don't even have dinner here. It's more of like either a snack or like I say, you have a bite before you go to something else. So in, in a way, it's kind of hard to make that comparison. Like you can't like you wouldn't you can't complain that a movie theater doesn't serve more intricate snacks because it's like you're not going there for dinner unless, you know, <laughs> that's that I know. I know. Well, I know like there's like the Alamo theaters where I went with my family like that. They've started to do that where you can go and you can get like cocktails you can get beer you can get more intricate food so like if it's something like that but the thing is it's but that's been designed for that purpose the average movie theater is not so similar thing here it's not a, it's not a full-fledged restaurant so like i don't feel as yeah. critical yeah. yeah here for the desserts we have some sour soft semi fred though which is coconut to cucumber and celery then beignets it's a pecan buttercream and rum rum caramel uh chocolate passion fruit cashew croquant and a doberge cake, which is a lemon buttermilk sorbet, lemon curd, and serves two guests. But yeah, an executive chef of Intersect is Nicolas Martinez. And uh, yeah, that's that's it for Intercept. And um, yeah, so I think I think we're we're back in, and your face is now back on the screen here for the conclusion of this part. As I mentioned, this is actually short for the ones we do. We normally have these, normally uh, we keep them to an hour and a half. And then if it goes over an hour and a half, we normally continue in different parts. Or if it's shortly above an hour and a half, we normally just push through and try to keep it uh, as close to that as possible. But this one is going to be uh, far under that. Uh, so yeah, um, you found this restaurant. Is this something you might go back and check out the actual, the, 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 what's the, the main restaurant area? What's, what are you thinking about this? So, yeah, so regarding the lounge, I may go back to the lounge maybe like once more at most, because as I say, it's a small menu. So it's like, you know, you, you you can go like you could probably try everything if you go like once or twice, you know, especially with a few people. Uh, I do want to check out the fine dining. I'm debating if I'm going to do it this month, though, because like I say, this month gets crazy busy. So unless I go at like, you know, early in the week at an early time or something. Um, but again, if Andrea is interested in going, maybe I, I said there, maybe we'll go there next month because it's like the city kind of dies down in January. So I'm sure, you know, there'll be plenty of openings. Um, but yeah, I'm definitely curious to check out some of this other food. Like I said, I'm pretty sure Rose went to the dining room and she spoke very highly of it and all the stuff they post looks amazing. So I definitely would be excited to check that out. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, that's it for now. And yeah. there's a few other places even has gone since we did the longer yeah. forms of these ones. So we'll have him back on to record some of these shorter ones or it's just like, okay, he went there with the, he, he went somewhere with his parents, he went somewhere with some other friends. So we'll we'll have him back on to talk about these small ones as we try to to lure the the elusive Andrea back in to finish the talk about Casa Lula, which is a cheese place, but with the Casa Lula series, there's also already one up where Stephen was talking about this, the things that he's had by himself. And as we mentioned, we're talking to other people as well to get them on for uh, different parts of the series and try to expand the food-specific ones. And we're also most definitely working on the I Know Great People one. It's It launched, it's, it's, it's up, it started, it launched it as a project in and of itself, but in some talks with some people, have a meeting set with Stephen tomorrow to record another part of a different series. But we're trying to get this work going, and, and slowly by sure, but surely, I think we're coming together in this. And thank you all who have been listening to this in specific, and also who have been here for several uh, videos and for some time with this. But yeah. So anything else you have to say about the restaurant or the series? Not really a whole lot else. I went to, I checked out a new, very interesting Chinese spot yesterday, which I actually found out via Instagram as well. It was funny. They actually liked some of my picks, and then I 
looked at their page and I thought, wow, this looks interesting. Let me check that out. So it's cool how Instagram is advertising this stuff and getting, you know, I mean, what they, if, if they do the page as well, it definitely would entice people to come in. And I'm thinking about going to the Chinese place when my parents come next month. I went by myself once. I'll probably go again because it's very, it's very reasonably priced. Like there's some pricier items, some more common, less, more conventional items. And, um, you know, you don't have to spend that much money, but there's also a lot of really authentic stuff that you don't see in most Chinese restaurants. So I think cool. that that could be a future video as well. Uh, Mineta Tavern, I think I have enough for like a whole other full-fledged presentation <laughs> by now. Um, but that, but I do want to do other places. We we still talked about doing um, Neta, my second to last job. And, you know, I, I definitely have uh, plenty of material. Oh, I was talking to someone about the Black Ant yesterday. I don't know if I've ever mentioned that. That's that high-end Mexican place. Um, yeah. They actually have Black Ants on guacamole and they serve grasshoppers and stuff. Before. Yeah. I have some material from there. I may go back there as well. So if I go back again, maybe I'll do a presentation with all that stuff as well. So I definitely still have a bunch of ideas for food. Yep. Okay. So that's what's on the menu. That's what you can look forward to. And um, yeah, I think that's <laughs> that's it for me on this part. Um, thank you all for listening, guys, gals, and everything else in between. Let us know if the specific restaurants that you've been to in the New York City area that you suggest Stephen check out, then you can go check out and let you know some things about that. If you, in particular, want to actually come on and talk about some things that you experienced, uh, let us know in the comment section. Let us know somewhere. I think we're going to start figuring out how to be open to that, figure out how to get more people into this whole thing. Uh, yeah, so you can say goodbye to the peoples. Bye. Thank you very much. All right. Goodbye.